Hi Vlad, how are you doing? All good. Hi Matthew, all good here. How are you? Yeah, doing very, very well. So it's nice and sunny down in uh, the UK. That's it. How are you in Brasov? Nice, uh, nice that uh, UK is sunny because Brasov is rainy and cloudy today. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that's it's, I, I it's, mean, the, it's reversed, uh, the reversed uh, usual setting, let's say. <laughs> Yeah, well, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, so my name is Vlad Rigoras. I am the founder of uh, Innovation Education Lab uh, NGO. And uh, what uh, we are about is uh, innovation education. We work a lot with non-formal education and uh, creating learning spaces for young people and young adults so that uh, we can empower them to take uh, action in the community and uh, not only the local community but uh, from the local to the international community and uh, we also connect them with other young people in uh, european communities so uh, we work a lot of uh, projects at european level and beyond Excellent. Well, so for people basically who are starting to watch this, what we're going to be doing is Matt and I are going to be talking about the future of education. Now, we're going to be putting this into a couple of different contexts. We're going to be having a look at how we teach children in the future. And this is sort of from today up to the next, say, 50 years. But actually, maybe more importantly, what we actually teach them. Uh, we're also going to be doing deeper dives into the state of existing education and whether or not the system that all of our children are actually going to and going through is in any way future fit. So I'll be bringing my perspectives as, as a global futurist. So hello, my name is Matthew Griffin. I'm the CEO and founder of the 311 Institute, which is a UK based global deep futures think tank. So I track over 600 emerging technologies, hundreds of different mega trends. I've written 15 books, including one on the future of education and learning. Because when we actually have a look at education, it's not just enough really to be talking about the future of education itself as a sector or an activity. We also, I think, need to be talking about the future of learning. And that's actually how we learn, the tools that we use to learn, and then how we retain information that is pertinent and relevant for the future. That's it. So, Vlad, I suppose, especially with that said, um, when we actually have a look at today's education system, I know you've got a young daughter. I've got two young children. So uh, Pippa, in my case, basically is 10. Uh, and she's been using artificial intelligence to actually help her accelerate her learning. Um, and she's slightly challenged on the learning front because she's dyslexic, as we found out a little while ago. Uh, and then Caden is 12. And he's also been experimenting with artificial intelligence to the point basically where when he was 10, he wrote a book. Um, which has since gone on to actually sell gangbusters for charity. So what do you, when, when we're talking about education as it is today, which is a little bit of a misnomer, because education as it is today is very similar to education as it was 100 years ago. And as I travel around the world, I don't think I've ever met a single minister of education, minister, headmaster, headmistress, university dean, uh, or parent who actually thinks that today's education system is, should we be very diplomatic here, appropriately educating our children for life in the future as we increasingly see it. You know, to put hmm. it in the words, especially of one of my students, so I teach and I lecture, uh, one of my students said, why is it that schools today are teaching us about the past but not the present or the future um and it's <laughs> i just think that's a great question and when you really when you really try to say no no they're teaching you about the future and the present it's very difficult not to uh it, it's very difficult to actually argue basically with with a question with a point of view oh yeah uh, yeah, it's a huge topic, Matthew, and I believe that uh, I mean we can we can touch base with several areas uh, that are of core importance, and I want to underline that 
uh, education happens on many levels and it starts uh, with the parents and the family uh, the extended family and then of course we get into the educational system let's say the formal educational system that is um, more or less directed by the public institutions so the state the governments and um, the other actors that are involved um, there is definitely some past uh, relevant learning points and the uh, systems and methods that are applicable like philosophical currents that uh, are still present let's let's take the greek philosophers uh, more um, i don't know we can take uh, manuscripts that are still brought up to the to the present yeah, yeah. and which have some very valid points in terms of uh, principles and uh, values that of course they are adapted to the present and now the question is like how is the education supporting us to adapt uh, values and to integrate values in the present super fast paced uh, world because um, the teachers are in a fast environment so it's maybe difficult to get the kids to to uh, reduce the speed or to perceive uh, the present as it is and um, deal with uh, all the um, constant chatter that is coming from the outside so that's why i'm saying that there are multiple uh, perspectives multiple layers to uh, to tackle this and it's a complex topic and i know that you love complexity huh <laughs> because it's super complex also what you're doing huh well I, I certainly used to love complexity because basically that's kind of how my mind works i like looking at all these different things that are actually taking place bringing them together and then trying to make sense of them all and saying right if this is what we see if this is the impact of what we see then you know this is a response or this is what we can do about it and um but increasingly the level of complexity is just going off the charts i mean if we have a look for example just at some of the latest artificial intelligences uh, so Gre jeffrey hinton who is the godfather of artificial intelligence uh, about a year ago said that he believes that in about five years time so where are we sort of 2029 so by 2030 mm -hmm it's highly likely that we will lose our ability to see the future okay now as a futurist that that kind of bugs me out um i look into these different topics and everything else and really what i wanted to do is i wanted to challenge be able to challenge him and say no i, I think we can still see the medium and deep term futures or in corporate speak sort of horizon two horizon three so on the one hand, I developed a couple of models, which I call the, the anchoring constants model, which is actually in the education book that I wrote, uh, which are designed to try to help us see up to 50 years out. However, Jeff, I said Jeff, you know, calling him, <laughs> he, might, he might not like me calling him that, but uh, Jeffrey basically would, uh, I think, actually have a point. Now, what I mean by this is when you have a look at the artificial intelligences, that mm. children as young as the age of say seven or eight are tapping into something like say chat gpt chat gpt has a measured iq a verbal iq of 155 and that was in 2023 it has a thousand times more general knowledge than any human it learns 300 million times faster than any human because a couple of minutes ago it just recompleted reading the entire web you know and everything and all all the good stuff on it obviously um you know when was the last time basically that most of us read a book you know we're up against artificial intelligences that you know it's just for breakfast, basically, they're reading everything on the planet, you know, and then trying yeah. to make sense of it all. Basically, all the newspapers at once. Let's say yeah, at I mean, once. I mean, you or, feel yeah. sorry for these AIs, right? You know, <laughs> it's reading, you know, any AI that reads Reddit or Twitter on a regular basis, you know, I'm very surprised <laughs> it's not unplugging itself. But um, as we kind of look towards 2028, 
bearing in mind we both have young children, artificial general intelligence, we believe, will have a an IQ of 1600, have a billion times more general knowledge than any human. And someone the other day, I typically say that its learning speed is unknown. And someone said, look, you know, come on, put a number on the learning speed of an artificial general intelligence. And so we kind of did this back of a fag packet um, calculation. And future artificial intelligence models, when you have a look at OpenAI, DeepMind, Anthropic, generally we think the models from what they say will be 10 times larger. Okay, so, mm. you know, 300 million, very, very horrible maths. You know, maths teachers turn away now. 300 million times 10, you know, you're talking about 3 billion. However, the size of the models basically are going to be 10 times bigger. The data centers that are going to be training them are going to be 10 times bigger. And I actually advise a lot of the uh, NVIDIA data center companies. Basically, we're building a billion dollar data center in Norway as we speak. Microsoft are investing $100 billion in a new AI data center called Stargate. But then on top of that, so these are huge numbers, huge models, huge numbers. But then on top of that, uh, what we're also starting to see is from NVIDIA's perspective, NVIDIA's CEO says that over the next five years, he envisages that GPUs will be a million times more performant. So you start ending up with an artificial intelligence model that could be learning three trillion times faster than a human. And then on hmm. top of that, we recently saw an AI that was not only developing, it was learning, but it was then developing its own synthetic content and bootstrapping its own artificial intelligence. So when we start thinking what life is going to be like in the workplace for our children that will be entering the workforce, say, mid 2030s early 2040s the numbers are insane yeah the reality that they will face certainly in the digital world you know which we can chat through will be insane and then we are should we say and i i, I say this very carefully i say and but we are stuck with an education system where the exams haven't changed really since the 1960s and 1980s, according to the headmasters of the UK's top private schools that I regularly speak to. So I advise organisations like University of Winchester and the Rugby Schools Group in the UK. These are kind of private schools where you're being charged £50,000 a year as a student. Um, same with the universities. Yeah, when you just have a look at some of the things that we actually face and then you put that into perspective with the current education, mainly secondary school education, slightly university education, the gap is staggering. Yeah, and uh, I mean, besides the, the gap, I think it's... And there are gaps in different areas. So, for example, we are working a lot with um, young people who live also in rural areas, who have uh, less opportunities to join uh, this sort of activities that we are doing, or let's say, yeah, learning programs where we have uh, experts who are delivering up-to-date information or. Uh, the fact that some universities have um, um, very outdated curriculums, universities, high school schools, and it's not about only the institutions, but it's also about the individuals. And uh, you know what information and data are the individuals exposed to. So I think there is also this gap between the people who are interested and who, who are curious and it's very nice that like you uh, myself you know maybe our networks here we we stay curious and we're hungry to learn hungry to be in the present for other people uh, the challenges or the 
opportunities are different. So now there is also this gap on how we um, take the information across to these groups of people that are uh, not necessarily interested in what we are, but they would benefit a lot to know what is happening. And I think that the social media, because I was just uh, checking out uh, with a group of young people that we worked in a, in a workshop on uh, circular economy and uh, um, healthy food. Yeah, and I was like, okay, but you know, on my social feed, I have a lot of stuff about sustainability, uh, health, uh, healthy food. How is your social feed? And they were like, oh, I, I see a lot of uh, promotions on uh, sneakers and um, I see different uh, phones and uh, mobile devices. And I was like, okay, I understand that basically what they are looking for is very different than what I am looking for, <laughs> you know? So despite the fact that the whole social media and online and uh, digital environment has all this data, if I'm not accessing it and I'm not aware that it exists, I'm not doing it. But then, you know, when they were involved in the, the activities, they were like, oh, it's so cool to learn about this and about that. So yeah. I do believe that their social feed changed. So I go back to this level of complexity that, yeah, we are preparing for the AI, we are preparing for uh, deep tech that is um, taking more and more um, speed and it's very powerful. So now uh, is the situation, okay, how do we get involved uh, exactly what you mentioned, the public institutions, the schools, the universities into delivering all this uh, data and to bridge yeah. so from um, our perspective we are we are doing a lot of uh, this work through the youth workers through the facilitators that we work with volunteers that we have and they go and reach out uh, various youth communities around Brasov for example and they bring some input and data on those topics because in our organization we stay up to date and we look to uh, to keep the whole uh, network of uh, collaborators um, up to date and up to speed on how we deliver different uh, pieces of information and yeah so i think that um, it's us each of us being the change you know, not talking about, okay, you have to be the change, but actually being the change and doing all this work to keep on bridging. And um, I don't want to hide it, but to say to fight a bit with, you know, with the status quo, because it is a lot of energy output to um, be willing to take new challenges, to take new learning yeah, and to step out of this comfort zone because yeah we can get a job and then the employers is like guys but we have this ai and you have to uh, unlearn and learn new stuff so yeah. like okay uh, <laughs> well, yeah. and that's it i mean it's you know the i think you've sort of hit quite a lot of nails on the head so one of the things that i love about what you guys are actually doing is on the one hand you're being proactive you're getting into your local communities and you're actually bringing children and young adults in to actually learn about should we say topics that they aren't actually taught at at school now a couple of my clients basically include organizations like gems education in motion you know so these sort of large private school groups for example and the, the, the problem that I kind of have basically with education, in and I'm being diplomatic here, you know, but the problem that I kind of have with education is, on the one hand, when you do go and speak to pretty much any stakeholder in any academic setting or with any kind of level of responsibility or involvement, basically, in today's education system, you know, whether it's a national system or a local system or what have you, yeah, they all fundamentally agree, basically, that things around us are actually changing. 
um, and that the national curriculums that the vast majority of children are not going through don't adequately prepare any children really uh, for what's here or what's coming. Now, you know, when we have a look at some of the core subjects, then of course, you know, languages, mathematics, some of the sciences, um, those are preparing children and giving children skills that they will find valuable throughout their entire life. But with the vast majority of entrepreneurs and adults that I talk to, yeah, the vast majority of them say, well, in my daily life, I'm only using 20 to 30% of what I learned at school. And that's generally language and it's reasoning, critical thinking, um, maybe a little bit of experimentation, a bit of maths, for example, you know, with the household budget. But, but that's about it. Now, you know, when we actually have a look at when we have a look at how the academic system and the educators are trying to bring new skills to students to help them move the dial to become a little bit more future ready, every single initiative is part of the informal education system. It's part of enrichment. You know, and as, as anyone basically in a school knows, basically enrichment, while absolutely valuable, is not part of the formal academic curricula. So exactly. when we have a look, for example, at things like technology or food science, you know, so my children are going through design and technology in the United Kingdom. And design and technology, this is where by the age of 14, overall, when you have a look at the UK national curriculum, and I'm paraphrasing because of time, you know, they are learning how to knit, uh, they are learning how to bake cakes. Now, a little while ago, I say I went into Sherfield School, which was part of the GEMS private education group. And we started teaching children about the future of food. So these were year six children, so they're about 10. And on the one hand, I can't, I absolutely agree with what you said earlier. The children were absolutely hungry for new information, you know, futures information, yes. And in fact, a lot of the children at this school had already been looking up things about Mars, you know, and how you would grow food on Mars. And that's before they even knew I was coming in to talk to them and give them, it was a, an eight piece lesson or an eight, we had eight lessons rather. Um, so on the one hand, basically the, the children were absolutely hungry for futures knowledge. Um, mm. Bearing in mind that a lot of schools that I talk to, they say, well, you know, this is probably stuff that our children aren't even thinking about. Um, Definitely. So that was that was kind of myth busted, num myth number one busted. Uh, secondly, as we stepped through things like precision agriculture and then we moved through to things like cellular agriculture, vertical farms, um, and we eventually got the children to start building brand new businesses. Um, Bear in mind, these children were 10. When the kids basically were putting together their new companies, and it would be, you know, Future Food Co, you know, ABC, uh, they were thinking about the competitors, you know, so when we have a look at the ability to grow food in new ways, they weren't just looking at McDonald's or the restaurant chains, they were looking at the supermarkets as their competitors and so on and so forth, the food delivery companies. Um, they were bringing in uh, some very interesting pet perspectives about multi-country pricing models, philanthropic models. Basically, they even thought about retraining. So, you know, if you are growing food in a vertical farm or you're using cellular agriculture, you know, where for people that don't know what that is, you take the cell from an animal, put it in a bioreactor and you basically grow a chicken nugget. So we've managed to find a way to do what happens inside of an animal in terms of growing flesh outside of the animal. So this is where we can create food and have created and are creating food, meat, genuine, authentic meat that is organic, et cetera, et cetera, without the actual animal. When we started having a look at it from those perspectives, the business models, basically the products they came up with was staggering. So mm. I do a lot of work with investors and the investors that I work with has, have about $60 trillion worth of assets under management. So organizations like BlackRock, Blackstone, Legal and General, UBS, City, you know, FAB, all these kinds of organizations. And the, the business models and the business presentations that the 10-year-olds put together 
was staggering. However, what was more staggering is when we went back to the headmaster, basically, and we actually started talking about what we had done and the results, 85% of what the children were taught or learned was not in any way represented in the UK national curriculum. So things like yeah. climate change and sustainability, that is obviously in the curriculum, so we kind of do that. But when I say 85% of what we taught the children was not in any way represented in the UK national curriculum, that I think clearly demonstrates the gap between what we are doing today from a technology and innovation perspective. And we could have mm. chosen space and telecoms and all sorts of other industries. And how the children are being prepared for life post school, whether that's post secondary school yeah. or university. And I think for me, while I see all these stakeholders agreeing that there is this need to teach children about new things, maybe not in new ways, but new things, the, the, my biggest bugbear by far is none of these people are updating the national curriculums. And if exactly. anyone really wants to have a conversation with me about that offline or online, feel free because I'm involved in education at a global level and a national level. Dun, dun. Exactly. Yeah. And you see, this is another yeah. gap that appears, you know, the gap that is between the educational system, the business sector and the employers, yeah. despite the fact that there are a lot of discussions. And I know that here in Romania, you know, there are all sorts of networking events, uh, all sorts of uh, summits, presentations, um people are engaging more and more and still you know what is missing the people who are executing and the yeah. people who are actually doing because i love talking you love talk we all love talking <laughs> it's just that at a point someone and uh some groups will have to start doing and then i know that you are also doing and I am also doing and our organizations are doing things because um, this is another gap between the talking. We love to hear our, ourselves talking and I think psychologically it's something very good and it's validating one's ideas and we're exchanging and we're looking for identifying um, a common ground that's like okay because it's maybe there are some innovative ideas I need to validate them in a way and from here I'm looking okay um, we get validation by attending a lot of events and exchange oh we are in on the same track let's do stuff and you know it happens many times also in our situation that uh, also in our team, also uh, in the partnership that we have, okay, we do, we have projects, we have funding, and then we have to start pulling each other from that comfort zone, from the gap, from the um, usual pathways that we have, because the innovation that we are figuring out, and this is another uh, important aspect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, So we have the doing part, we have the uh, figuring out the reality. I mean, we're figuring out more and more of what is happening around and uh, what can be improved. And um, I think that all of us want to do good things. It's just that um, because we are missing this gap of doing and you say, like, okay, I don't find the people who are doing uh, and we're not moving together and you catch a bit of more speed. So then there's a gap that is created. So in this way, uh, we look to sit down and see like, okay, guys, let's uh, focus a bit. There are a lot of ideas, possibilities, opportunities, and let's choose uh, what best suits most of us and then there's the another third thing that you mentioned about the school um, and it is applicable uh, and i think it can solve this part of the doing because in schools if you look 
what is happening we're talking a lot you know people and young people are taught a lot through talking and in certain situations that are um, good examples they're also doing things but um, if we have this experiential learning this non-formal education when there's less input from the teachers and less um, Theor theoretical exploration but you know like guys let's go there are forest schools there are some um, some concepts some educational systems alternative in general yes so alternative systems that are exposing um, children young people more to this experiential part where they get to engage with nature and to understand because we understand nature we understand society we understand, um, I don't know, from uh, sciences to philosophy, and then we can uh, innovate and look at the future. But without experiencing it and knowing it and knowing what we're talking about and how it functions through direct experience, because how would it be that uh, we have uh, another common friend who is not a father and he's talking to us about fatherhood or parenthood? Yeah. We're like... Well, well, you know, like it's, I, I don't know if uh, you get all those three elements that I was uh, mentioning and how they uh, interact with your ideas that you presented yeah. earlier about the systems. Well, it's, yeah, so again, you're right, you know, there's one thing talking about the need for change and the reasons for change. And when you talk about the need and the reasons for change, I haven't met anyone that says, that's a load of tosh, you're wrong, we don't need to change. Which, on the one hand, basically is, is kind of comforting. Um, I do like people actually sort of confronting me and saying, well, actually, we do think you're wrong, you know, we don't need to change. Um, but globally, that, yeah, I do a lot of work in China, and when you go to China, basically, you know, we think of the Chinese education system as being much further ahead than the Western system, because that's what we see in the press. But actually, again, yeah, the chairman of Hong Kong University that I spoke to a little while ago basically says, yeah, we need to change. Uh, the Chinese parents, um, again, are, you know, our children are a bit lazy. Um, and we are, why are we, te why are we teaching them what we're teaching them? You know, and you sort of think, well, you're in China, you know, you're supposed to be, you know, you're supposed to be the, the yardstick that increasingly everyone is actually sort of using to benchmark their own sort of, uh, education systems and so on and so forth um but you know when we actually so on the one hand i see people see the need and the reason to change um one of the ceos the group ceos of one of the world's largest private school companies uh again she actually agrees we need to change however when it comes to changing there seem to be quite a lot of different barriers now on the one hand we need to change the curriculum now, the only people who can change national, the formal curriculums, are typically governments. And again, government ministers will agree that there is a need for change. But government ministers are voted out, generally, on a two to four year cycle. So you can have one education minister saying, I absolutely agree, this is what we need to do, we're going to do it, and then two years later, if not less, they're actually out and the new person comes in and says, so what were we talking about again? So there's that is an issue. Um, secondly, a lot of the people in power don't really know what we actually need to change, which you can solve with you know, consulting and having debates and discussions and everything else like this one and looking outward. Um, thirdly, though, uh, there is the issue of staff resourcing. So I, I do a lot of work with private schools, state schools and universities, and I've never come across a, should we say, secondary school basically said, you know what, we've got all the resources that we need. If we were going to start teaching, you know, uh, should we say more relevant topics, you know, I won't say, you know, AI, but say software development, um, you know, immersive worlds. Um, I've got schools basically whose economics teachers have been specifically told that they should never ever talk to or teach students about the world of crypto because it's not in the national curriculum 
Um, so when we actually have a look at staff resourcing, staff skilling, it is a huge problem, but there are a couple of ways that we can actually overcome that. Um, and then without changing the national curriculum, all of the schools that I talk to, on the one hand, they agree that change is needed. But then on the other hand, they say, as this uh, group CEO that I was recently talking to about said, we can all know the reasons for change. We can all absolutely agree that the current national curriculum and school system is not adequately preparing children for the futures that they are going into. However, as long as, a, as, long as we as a school are being graded against exams that were set in the 1960s and 1980s, we are always going to have to teach to the curriculum. And from a parent perspective, bringing parents into this loop, yeah, what would, as a parent, and I've got an Oxford University story as well in a minute, as a parent, what would you prefer your school says? Would mm. you prefer that your school says, um, thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, um, because of what we have been doing as a school, your child is now future proof, not future ready, but future proof. Um, however, in their latest GCSE exams, your child uh, got a huge number of D's and E's or, you know, numbers. Yeah, uh, sort of uh, not nice, but say fours and fives. Yeah. So what would you rather have? Would you rather actually, would you rather your child's school says your child is future proof? but they've got a lot, lot of fours and fives in their GCSEs, which is basically the akin of a fail. Or would you rather that the school says, we've got great news, uh, your child basically got A stars in all of their A-level subjects. And then they go to the employer, like a Microsoft or a Google or whoever it happens to be, and the employer says, well, that's all great, but actually, You've got a variety of hard skills as a, as a student, but we don't need any of those really. So mm. a lot of the, a lot of the, I, I deal with a huge number of multinationals and they say increasingly they hire, they hire based on attitude and aptitude, and then they will teach the new employees, the intakes, uh, using nano degrees. So mm. on the one hand, from a from a parent perspective would you send your children to a school that says hey we are absolutely rubbish at getting your children good grades in gcse's and a levels but the good news is they're future fit or do you want to send your your kids to a school that says we guarantee that your children are going to get nines in gcse's and they're going to get A stars in their A levels. But in terms of future fit, we're going to leave that to somebody else. The exactly, answer yeah. is you want both, right, as a parent. But the, the current national curriculum and examination systems are all geared towards you trying to get an A star in history at A level or whatever it happens to be. And so going back to Oxford University, this, um, this group CEO that I was talking to recently, she said, we can teach children informally as much as we like about the future in terms of hard and soft skills. But when our children are trying to apply to the University of Oxford, who are also one of my, my clients, when, my children, when our children are trying to apply to the University of Oxford, the University of Oxford wants to see A stars across the board in the exams. And then you speak to the Oxford and Cambridge examination boards about updating these exams. And in the UK, the rugby schools group that I talk to are, why haven't these exams been updated in like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years when the world around us has changed so keeps on going. Why, why, why? But you said you're going to do it. And yeah, this is yeah but there was no one to do it. And you know, my colleague here, he started to do it, but then someone else took over and they forgot. That's it. And it's, and this is sort of the problem. You know, what we have is we have 
a huge number of important stakeholders that see the need for change and in quite a lot of cases actually want to change Definitely, but then you yeah. get dragged back into the institution that is formal education and election cycles and it's a bit hard or very yeah. hard and suddenly in 10 years time the children going through secondary school in the uk will probably still be being taught what i was taught in the 1990s yeah it and uh... it doesn't fly i mean when i went to school in the 1990s yeah there was no internet and yet again you know one of the examples i use with educators is i say I come from the year 2024, so I have perfect knowledge of the job market in 2024. And in 2024, there is a high level of demand for cybersecurity analysts and researchers. And if you went back to, say, the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, and you spoke to the presidents and prime ministers, the heads of school, uh, with this perfect knowledge they would say well okay if, if, if you have perfect knowledge of the future and in the future there is this demand for cyber security experts what is a cyber security expert and you say well a cyber security expert is somebody who protects information data and assets across the internet all right and uh, now you can see the next question because they go Okay, what is the internet? Bearing in mind the people who were taught in the 1980s and 1990s are in their 40s and 50s now. You know, so we can still basically act, we can we can still go and apply for these jobs. You say, well, the internet is this system that has changed everything about the world. It connects four and a half billion people via a giant computer network. At what point? Do you think, A, you would be kicked out of the room? And B, at what point do you ever think that the presidents and prime ministers of that time would say, I think we need to change our education system and put in a cyber security yeah, course? They yeah. Would. It's, yeah. And that's the thing. We are continually stuck in the status quo, not because we but have to be, think, but because we why choose do you, to be. Because? Because we choose to be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is, uh, I mean, listening and uh, going deep uh, into a vis visual image of what you're saying, I think we go again in this uh, complex nature of uh, you know of being of uh, living uh, on this planet and all the layers because you know i i'm thinking for example from the 90s let's say yeah, mm -hmm. we had the world wide web developing and all these successive professions kept on developing based on the needs of the actual needs that uh, were appearing, you know, because, okay, we need cybersecurity, but what else do we need? We need innovation. We need to research more uh, in the medical field, in that field, etc., etc. So all these needs are coming up because something is happening. And there are so many events that are happening. And I go back to us as individuals and our ability to listen to each other to understand the needs that we have and um, you know, not talking only about the parents, but also talking about the teacher and then the teacher talking to the headmaster. Yes. Yeah, so the teacher would say like, okay, you know, I have all these uh, kids in the classroom. We need to change uh, something in the curriculum because they need something else. And they will say, yeah, let's do it. And then they keep on going further up the hierarchy and say, we need, we need. And then, you know, maybe some needs are uh, forgotten, deleted, uh, distorted, yeah. <laughs> you know. So, and they will say like, okay, guys, but it doesn't fit with the with the political I I agenda. Or the, and we're like, okay, you know, like we don't need the political agenda. We need to look at the needs of those people and to 
understand and to observe. So um, that's why I go back to to this part where small actors like us, like organizations, like small organizations, small groups of people are doing local activities locally impact agreeing with the teachers and schools like we do we go to the schools and say look this is what we can offer and in uh, some schools we come to do let's say to take over uh, a class or two classes uh, during a day to do non-formal education activities or experiential activities through the volunteers or through the experts that we work with and it is a blend and i do believe that slowly slowly things are shifting definitely it is taking a lot of time to go with um, within changes in the system because also teachers are getting frustrated parents are getting frustrated and in romania you know they have whatsapp groups they are fighting in the whatsapp groups the teachers with the parents and parents between them like no you should do this and no do it this way no in this way and that way and it's like wait 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 hold on you know like there's something definitely broken and that's again in the complex uh, complexity of the system and the systems it's not only in the educational system but maybe with the the parents that are not uh, some parents are not in constant development of professional personal development uh, being in uh, i don't know psychotherapy sessions or um, finding something that is harnessing and feeding their inner being um, and the inner balance so you know it's uh, i'm realizing that you know the whole uh, interaction between the different areas and layers are uh, mm-hmm. counting but i think that definitely um, there is a possibility that we start uh, from scratch in a way that we are creating and co-creating uh, uh, a new system that is more adapted not a new system of course we take a lot from uh, everything that's been happening in the past that is happening in the present so we can uh, shift towards a future that is uh, fulfilling the needs because it's um, it would be the most uh, impactful and effective and the question would be okay nice ideas who is going to do it (laughs) And it's, well, when you get into government, especially, there's a lot of, well, on the one hand, there is a lot of finger pointing, but then at some point, people stop pointing the fingers at other people and just stop pointing all together, which is why nothing actually kind of gets done. So with some of the universities that I work with, so I work with uh, Carnegie Mellon University, Michigan State, Greenwich University, UCL in the UK as well. Um, Yeah. There, there are kind of three questions that I say that nobody, especially children, have ever been asked by anybody. Okay, so when we actually, when we moved the education system back 100 to 200 years ago, Gary Vyachuk, and I can never, I can never say his, his surname properly, so he's, the, so he's, he's in charge of, or he's the CEO of um, Viner Media, he's all over the place. Um, he says... He's got a couple of interesting point of viewpoints based on education. On the one hand, basically, he says education today teaches our children defense. Now, what he means mm. by that is education today is really teaching you how to try to get a job for a company. Now, he says basically that from an education perspective, because he's an entrepreneur and he actually flunked in uh, at school and he he's shown people his grades and everything else and he holds them up with pride going i failed at school but now i run a multi-million pound company or multi-hundred million pound company and so on and so forth and he says schools should be teaching our children offense you know and he sort of think well, okay, well what does that actually even mean and it means rather than teaching children our children how to fight how to get a job for a company He thinks children should be taught how to create the company and work for themselves, you know. And in fact, actually, when you have a conversation with economists, entrepreneurs are typically 
the growth engine of entire economies, you know, because an entrepreneur builds a successful business, gets more money in, hires people, you know, that's the growth engine. That's what governments are really after, you know, good, strong economic growth and top line GDP growth. And that yeah. brings in taxes and everything else. Um, but he also sort of says, you know, on the other hand, you know, artificial intelligence, if we look at that, he says, AI is the tractor. You know, it's the printing press and it's the loom. Now, the reason why he kind of says that is because in the creative industry that he's in, bearing in mind that AI is increasingly creative, which people always said AI can never be creative. You know, therefore, as humans, we should all become right brain thinkers and doers rather than left brain, because AI will come and automate the left brain jobs, you know, uh, logical jobs, but it will never, ever be able to automate creativity. And for 10 years, I've been saying it absolutely can automate creativity because creativity is, as much as we don't like it, a process. You know, when we yeah. look at innovation, you can buy books on how to step through the innovation process. And if something is a process, you can break it into an algorithm and you can automate it. And in fact, in the US, uh, I think it was Harvard did a recent study. They found that AI is now in the top 1% of human creatives, albeit in that case for storytelling. So sci-fi writing, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but anyway, so Gary sort of says AI is the tractor because it will automate a lot of jobs. Um, but when you think of this in, when you think of that statement from, from our kids' perspective and a school perspective, if AI is the tractor, as an analogy, then as AI starts taking jobs, there is the there's the temptation that we as farmhands look at the tractor and think as a farmhand, this tractor is going to automate my job. What am I going to do? I need to go and find another farmhand job with a farm that doesn't have a tractor, you know, mm -hmm. etc. So that's one way to look at AI is the tractor. But the other way, and probably the right way to think about this, is rather than looking at the AI tractor and saying, it's going to automate me, I need to go and get the same job in a different company. No school is teaching you how to be the CEO of John Deere. Exactly. So yeah. You can either look at, I mean, you know, there's lots of other technology topics we can talk about that in, impact and influence the future of jobs and careers and the value of those jobs in terms of remuneration but shouldn't school be teaching us how to be the ceo of john deere not how to be a better farmhand and then, you know it's and then just lastly on the on the three questions um the three questions that no children have ever been asked that you and i have sort of chatted through in the past is as a, in certain age, 16 year old, what would you do if the only things you had access to was all of the world's information? What would you do if the only thing that you had access to was all the world's skills? My kids are not software developers because at the moment at school, they're being taught scratch, but that's about it. And yet they can use an artificial intelligence to write software because we've done it. So as artificial intelligence automates individual jobs, tasks and skills, it gives access to those skills to people who haven't specifically been taught them. So what would you do if you only had access to all the world's knowledge? So information plus AI is generally knowledge, all the world's skills. And then, you know, I'm not an artist, but I can use an AI to create art, etc. My son's not an author, but he used AI to write a book, etc. that sold $25,000 dollars worth. But then thirdly, 
if you were then able to have an idea or bring a product that you thought of in your head, bearing in mind that with AI, we're, we're seeing Under Armour use AI to develop new sneakers and shoes and everything else. AI is developing new rocket engines in six hours with a company called Hyperganic in Germany. But then could take that idea or the new product that you have just created with the help of these new technology tools. And if you knew how to execute perfectly, you could have that new product or that new, or that new idea in front of four and a half billion connected people by the end of the day. Hmm. Yeah, as you say, today we what? all have more power, more power than any king or queen or president or prime minister in history. But how is the education system helping our children navigate a world where the only things they have access to is all the world's knowledge, all the world's skills, and the ability to scale their businesses or ideas to a global audience, literally with the click of a button. That's a, I mean, it's scary, but when you that think is, about it in terms yeah. of human potential. I got a bit lost in, in like, wow, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's it's, a, it's, what, what, what would you say? To Ikigai. Well, I mean, so Ikigai, you know, it's the, as a child, you know, or as an adult, what's your purpose? What do you love doing? What gets you out of bed in the morning? And then that's, that's where school can help. Um, mm. But then the next piece is you need to adapt and learn at speed because the world's changing faster. Uh, and with my daughter, we used AI to accelerate her learning 12 fold. So we crammed a, a whole year four academic curriculum into three weeks and she passed, which is fantastic and just insane. Um, but then oh, wow. what's, your, what's your purpose? But then from an Ikigai perspective, which is the Japanese methodology, what are you good at? And what does the world need that it would pay you for? And it's that pay piece, you know, bearing in mind that school's trying to prepare children for careers and for earning money across the next 50 years. You know, that's where you end up in the future of work, future of jobs conversations. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, th that's what I was, uh, I, I wanted to ask you. So uh, what would be the best interventions in the i mean from the teacher side let's say yeah. uh, in order to to facilitate uh, the, the learning of those skills those future skills like let's say because what i was taking from the questions uh, you were posing to um, to the audience and to ourselves um, i took creativity being a lot of uh, one of the drivers and uh, the reasoning and the problem, complex problem solving. Well, so what would, what would the teacher uh, yeah. so, prepare to do this? Yeah. So, so what we've, so what we've done and what we've seen works well, but it's always a work in progress is on the one hand, I believe and others believe that children should be exposed to information about, I'm not going to say the future, but about what's going on, you know, because once you see, so say, for example, we take the future of food, you know, once you yeah. have shown children what the future of food could look like, will look like and everything else, um, then it's very much a case of, then it's very much a case of, um, okay, here's a, here's a load of information, and then it's kind of the, okay, so what? Um, you let the children get a point of view on it, debate and discuss it. You know, what do we care about and why? Um, so simply having access to information about things that are going on today, changes that are happening today, let alone yeah. sort of in the deeper future, is, is the first piece. Um, Secondly, then it's as we've sort of we've said before, you know, it's that experience, experiential learning. So, give you an example. Um, okay, I've 
given a child a huge amount of information about different technologies, different industry sectors, different trends, and so on and so forth. Um, one of the problems that the world faces is, say, climate change. So when we have a look mm -hmm. at the United Nations SDGs, there's 17 of those. So we typically use these in schools. Um, and then say to children, right, okay, based on what you have seen and the information that you've taken in, how would you solve climate change? And you literally dump them in. I mean, in some cases, you know, we literally dump them in. And and really, really. Two deep. years. Yeah. Two I mean, years of research and projects and uh, ideas that they can be exploring and they can be learning maths and physics. Yeah. and. Well, this is it, you know, and it's so what you have is so on the one hand, you, you need cross domain um, teaching and knowledge. Uh, yeah. So in some of the schools, basically, that I'm working with, basically, you know, they typically call this thematics. So some of the schools I work with have now actually got specific lesson time for just thematics. And there's not mm. necessarily any particular um, any lesson plan in these, but it's a case of you've learned about maths, you've learned about some technology, you've learned about some biology. Uh, you know, let's now bring that together and let's see how all of these can interact with one another to maybe solve a problem, whatever that problem yeah. is. But um, what we typically find even with 10 year olds is once they have been given access to information in a variety of different formats, whether it's virtual, in person, what seems to work really, really well, um, they can then explore those subjects and topics. So for example, with the second lesson that we did on the future of food, which was really just a positioning lesson. The lesson was about an hour long. We had at least 50 questions from the students. We actually had to lengthen the lesson, which was fortunate because it was near break time. But they, the kids just kept going. The number of questions they were asking about future food was, yeah, well, if we can print food, then can we print food with any flavor? And, you know, what happens to the cows and, you know, what happens to X, Y and Z and, you know, uh, etc. The number of questions was insane. In fact, it was so insane. Mm. We thought we were just going to have to stop the lesson. So that curious and inquisitive nature that kids have, that we as adults, it's kind of been beaten out of us long ago by the corporate, you know, by, by corporations um, was staggering. But uh, sort of bringing it back, exposure to information is the first thing. Secondly set the children a problem or give them a yeah. task um, yeah. you don't necessarily need resources for this either you can whiteboard stuff you can talk through things and then just almost let it fly um and they can ask for the resources you know they can yeah. realize and like ah oh, look matthew i need uh, a laptop i need uh, a transport collaboration from space you know yeah, yeah. 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 It's, they, or, and this is it. It's, um, you know, so, so Sonny Varkey, um, I mean, even when we start having a look at uh, some of the sort of the more exorbitant ways that we can change teaching uh, up the road, basically, we've got a virtual reality school uh, called Cam Campus XR, which is just superb. Um, I sat down with Sonny Varkey, who was the founder of GEMS Education at Dorchester in London many, many years ago, uh, before we sort of started doing some things together. And he said, you know, the problem that I have is, you know, I want to extend education to 100 million children around the world who typically have no access really to very much formal education. And, uh, you know, we were talking about 3D printers and he said, you know, one of the problems that we would have trying to teach children about 3D printing um, is, is the fact that I'd have to ship 10,000 3D printers to 10,000 schools. And this trying to scale some of this physical stuff was just insane. Wow. Now, on the one hand, you know, there's there's a couple of ways that we can kind of counter this need, this this problem of scaling. On the one hand, we sort of said, well, you don't need to necessarily ship a 3D printer to every school on Earth for children to actually appreciate or learn about what a 3D printer is what it can do and how it can change different parts of the world, whether it's how we manufacture products, um, mm. et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, mm. you can teach children 
And this is what we sort of did through this course, which is again is in this future of learning and uh, future of education and learning book that I did. Um, you can teach children about the concept, some really quite extreme technology concepts just by simply telling them, you know. So if we take future of food where I say, I take a cell from an animal and uh, you say to the kids, you know, what's a cell? And they say, well, a cell basically is a, you know, is a, is a, I mean, the, you know, the, look up the definition anyway, but you know, a cell basically is a thing within an animal basically that replicates and whatever. You say, well, you take one of those cells and you put it in a bioreactor. And a bioreactor is simply a kind of manufacturing device that replicates mm. and grows more cells. And they go, oh, I'll get that. And then the next step is, once this bioreactor has replicated enough cells and grown enough cells, you end up with a chicken nugget. Very simplistic terms, but they go, oh. So I take a cell from an animal, put it into something that grows more meat or grows meat, grows more cells, and then I've got a chicken nugget. And then I've got one chicken that can feed the entire planet protein and meat sustainably at scale for for a for a cost that's that that costs less than the food that we get in the supermarket there you go you've taught them the concept and then the second oh, yeah. way that we can do it is you can use virtual reality but virtual reality while excellent in terms of retention you know we're seeing 64 percent level improvements in retention in vr schools the fact is you need the hardware you need the networks you need the content um schools basically need the money for the subscriptions and all that kind of stuff and even in the uk one thing that we found basically when we were sort of talking about uh, access to new academic uh resources like khan academy um etc cetera, etc cetera, the vast majority of state schools in the uk do not have the simple ability to go out and take out a subscription with an ed tech company to benefit their own students. It's all got to go through corporate central government. Um, so while we have all these interesting new tools, albeit sort of more for the informal education side of the fence, you know, even the way that schools run procurement, let alone funding, actually just is another barrier that we have to trying to should we say, improve the state of education? Yeah, yeah. This is truly thought provoking. And it's, it's so, when, and so a, a long time ago, I started doing a lot of work with the UK government, so Department of Education. I also do a lot of work basically with the UAE governments, uh, Middle Eastern governments and American governments on things like education. And for a long time, about 10 years ago, people went, if you want to change the system, you've got to speak to basically the Minister of Education. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what I found was you could speak to the Minister of Education. I spoke to so many of them, you know, I could have a nice little plaque on the wall. Um, but realistically, you just keep, like we said earlier, you just keep talking. And, yeah, and we are it's after too talk, yeah? we're after action. And so when you have the only other way, if you can't change the system from within, then the only other way that you can disrupt a system or an industry is from outside. You know, if you have a look at Elon yeah. Musk, for example, he disrupted the global automotive industry, and yet he was not fr he was not an incumbent. Um, yeah. you know, it's there are lots and lots of examples. You know, Google disrupted autonomous transport or disrupted the transportation systems in the US, and yet they're a search company. Um, there are lots and lots of examples of where incumbents have been resistant and or unable to change or unwilling to change. And in the end, they've been disrupted from the outside. Now I know that the Khan Academy, um, the Khan Academy are, are very passionate about disrupting global education. So not just what is taught, but how it's taught, um, which is excellent. 
but as long as schools are expected to get their students to take the exams that were set in the 1960s and 80s, it doesn't matter that we have all these fancy ways to teach children new things in new ways. If, as many of the headmasters and mistresses I speak to, the entire system is rigged to teach to the exam. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this part with the exams, in a way, it's good. I mean, I, I just take uh, this last, uh, last thing that you mentioned. Uh, it's good if you want to assess where you are. And I think it's about the framing of what an exam is because uh, the frame is uh, pretty disastrous in terms like, okay, in order to move forward, you have to take this exam and you're like freaking out like, fuck, what do I do now? Because I'm not moving forward. So, uh, but going again back to the part of disrupting the system, I do believe, and I hope it is in this way, that the, the system wants to be disrupted and would put uh, resources in the force and the entity that is disrupting it because it's uh, disrupting it towards uh, moving forward and growing and yeah, to, to get uh, evolved in a way. And also, uh, earlier, when you mentioned Gary Vaynerchuk, uh, I think, uh, you know, like teaching everyone uh, more skills and uh, better ways to act out those abilities and um, capabilities of reasoning. And because I think, as you were mentioning earlier, this is what we need to be taught, you know, like. Uh, all those skills of the future so we don't get into listing them but they are skills that um, you know, back uh, in the days uh, where the philosophers uh, who were spending a lot of time were cultivating and those are also some values and some principles that are adopted like okay to question and to be curious and to understand and to observe so um, those are some qualities that um, human beings um, have had in the past, have in the present, and uh, definitely we will have and we will evolve them in the future and to become better at those. So with those qualities put out uh, and acted out, we can decentralize a lot of this sole proprietor proprietorship and ownership that the state has that the big uh, corporations have and you know allow the um, communities and people uh, because this is how we work as in tribes and in communities yeah we line up some limits and to some uh, boundaries that we set and some constraints that we are setting however that we can uh, each in our communities because the contexts are different the resources are different yeah. we can act out because let's say if uh, we have the mountain nearby and we have some castles nearby here um yeah we go yeah, to well, Brassard castle is beautiful yeah yeah and i we, know we, that we, you've been here well one of the local taxi drivers is from Brassard. that's an easy he, he always used to go go to go to the castle <laughs> so we have to go to the castle. Yes, yeah, so we can use the context that we are in and to adapt the teaching because maybe what's happening here in Brasov is not happening in a different region in Romania, but something else is happening there and they can use uh, the local resources and the context for multiple purposes. And also to offer uh, young people experiences and to take them out. Okay, guys, let's go out because definitely, definitely uh, they need to go out and be out to understand, observe, uh, learn, and to see entrepreneurs, to see how they work. Like, you know, I, I want to make a small analogy, a personal um, inside that uh, when when i was in high school 
um, I didn't have the opportunity to go and check what uh, profession, how the professions are, you know. Yeah. And like, okay, I want to study psychology. And my teacher who was uh, training me and um, tutoring me to take uh, the exam in the university, she was like, you know, Vlad, what are you going to do with psychology in this world? And I was like, yeah, you know, I have these opportunities maybe to work with groups of people. And she was like, no, it's very miserable. Look, I have I have two jobs, one in the high school and one in the university, and it's difficult. And because I didn't have the opportunity to talk to others or I didn't have the courage to say, like, look, I want to talk with someone who is practicing this. And... Uh, to understand how it is because in Romania people were not going to psychotherapists yeah and yeah. then she was like you know maybe you're better suited by understanding how you want to impact the world and how you want to do things maybe it's better that you're going for law and then one month before the final exams I said like yeah I should go to law and I was like oh my god and now somehow I'm back to doing what I wanted to do. Exactly, but yeah. many and, years later. And, yeah, and years later. And it's not because, um, you know, the um, everything that I've been doing didn't help me because I had great experiences and I've learned a lot by uh, studying law, despite the fact that in the first year of uni, I worked in mortgage brokerage, let's say, I mean, I was doing something else and I, I had direct experience with professionals, with the uh, people who were entrepreneurs and, you know, this is what helped me a lot, yeah. you know, to get uh, to understand other things and, you know, at some points I was talking to my teachers and saying like, look, I have to work. I will need to catch up with the, the courses because I need to work because I wanted to work and to engage in different interactions and learn other things. Yeah. So, you know, with this analogy, what I also want to emphasize is that maybe um, it is important that we are offered experiences before choosing careers. And I know that in Western uh, Europe and ca other countries, it's the gap year and the people are checking out things and it's easier to shift careers. It's easier to accept people who are shifting careers because when, when I came back to, to Romania, because I did a um, graduate diploma in law in, in Britain, in UK, uh, to learn about the common law, um, not only the civil law system. So, um, you know, it came uh, like, ah, oh, but uh, I came back to um, a law office to, you know, to look for a job. And they said, ah, oh, but you, you've been working too many things. Because, you know, in, in UK, I worked uh, part-time in a hotel to pay uh, my bills. Yeah. And I was uh, also doing other initiatives, um, clubs and gatherings, uh, exploring entrepreneurship uh, and also studying and also applying to hundreds of law firms. Um and they said, okay, but you, you've been doing too many things. And I was like, yes, yeah, so I have a well-rounded experience. And they were like, yeah, but you know, you're not, a, you're not a good fit. And I was like, I was thinking like, first I was struck. And then I was like, you know, like this is uh, the culture and how the local culture is propagated and what are the values of the culture that I mean. And yeah, it started to change and it is changing. Yeah. It's just that it's another element culture to be a pro. So the decentralization, the cultural element that is uh, very powerful, that it yeah. brings a lot of values and um, they form, it forms the values of the people in a community or in a country. Yeah. So a lot of work, a lot of work. Oh, absolutely. And it's, you know, I mean, there's a load to unpack there. I mean, so for example, when we have a look at the future of skills, 
Um, the average half-life of a skill now, typically a hard skill, is between two to five years. And some of the work that I've been doing with Pepsi, where we actually have a look at the future of the learning and development organization. So Pepsi have 300,000 people, about 100,000 of those, where you're actually in uh, sort of, you know, corporate positions, shall we say, and the rest are in distribution and so on and so forth. Uh, when you actually have a look at you know, the future of half skills being, or the future of skills being about two to five years, on the one hand, that means basically that we need solid soft skills. Um, and we need switchable hard skills, which is what we're seeing in the workforce now. But when we actually have a look at soft skills, these are things like curiosity, creativity, grit, determination, resilience, uh, you know, a lot of the things that you've mentioned, entrepreneurship, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, another group that I work with is the LaSalle group of universities. So they have 64 universities around the world. And they say that increasingly more and more of the employers that they work with are asking them to prioritize the teaching of soft skills more than hard skills. So it used to be the case that most universities around the world, and we see this in the United States as well, would, would incorporate about 25% of course content would be not really targeted at, at would, but would complement the development of soft skills you know, collaboration, teamwork, uh, critical thinking, that kind of stuff. But now a lot of universities, including in the UK, are starting to think, well, how do we actually change the ratio of hard skills to soft skills development so it's more 50-50? You know, so that's a huge change, but that's at the university level. Schools are kind of coming along as well, but it's a little bit slower and a little bit more awkward. Um, but then in terms of career advice, yeah, my career advice was, uh, what are you interested in? And I said, the sea, basically. Uh, and they went, right, well, you should be a marine biologist. And I was like, right, fine. Uh, so I went off to Bangor in North, North Wales to take uh, a degree in, uh, a joint honours degree in marine biology and oceanography. But what they should have really said to me is, what are you interested in? And I'd say, well, the seas and the oceans and everything else. Oh, and by the way, you know, in what sort of earning level would you like? Because as I very quickly found out, I see in the marine biologist world, there's not much money in it. You know, it's I would I loved doing marine biology, but actually couldn't really put food on the table. You know, so that's kind of a bit of an issue there. But with a lot of careers advice, on the one hand, there's two things I sort of like to raise. Generally, as parents and as adults, we often say to children what do you want to be when you grow up and what we're really asking is what job title do you want when you grow up it's like i want to be a nurse i want to be a firefighter i want to be an investment banker obviously that one comes up a lot with children i want to be an astronaut um yeah we're asking them what job do they want in the future and i always think that a better question to ask is what do you want to achieve? Now, let's face it, we know that kids, even adults, we don't really know what job we want, what we want to achieve, because coming back to Ikigai that we mentioned earlier, we don't really take time to think, what am I passionate about? What's my purpose? What would get me up out of bed every morning for the next decade? You know, so we often don't just give ourselves time to really think, what do I actually want to do? You know, where's my North Star, as Ernst and Young would kind of say. Um, but I've actually been a career counsellor myself, and I did some work a little while ago, basically with the Year 13s. And what struck me about some of the Year 13s, and these are sort of 18-year-olds who are literally now going to university, um, I'd say to, we had a group of 30 in one case, and I said, why are you all going to university? And 80, 80, I mean, literally more, but kind of 80, look, you're laughing. See, 80% of them kind of said, well, just because I am. And I think it's because that's what my parents expect me to do. <laughs> yes. And it's like, well, okay, that's, that's just, we'll unpack that another time, you know. But anyway, and <laughs> we had, uh, there, were, there were kids in there who were going to do fine art, dentistry, law, and all sorts of other things. 
And when we had a look at the future of jobs, where we are from a technology perspective today, um, you know, I talk, I'm always chatting to my kids' dentists about this because they work, one of the ladies works up at Guy's and St. Tommy's. And um, she, you know, when we have a look at the future of dentistry, for example, we're 3D printing teeth now for implants. Um, we actually have seen, so, we've seen a horrible thing, depending on your point of view, emerge twice now. We've got fully autonomous robot dentists in China and in America that will literally put the teeth, put your, put teeth in your head. Um, and when we still started having conversations about law, so I do a lot of, a lot of work with law firms like Allen and Overy and Dentons and DLA Piper and those kinds of guys. Um, they said, well, when you're going to do law, what sort of thing are you interested in? You know, and the kids were like, I don't know, really. And you're going, okay, right. So you, you're all going to university for really the next three years, generally because you think your parents, you know, that's what your parents want. But they had had the conversation about that with their parents. Um, secondly, you don't really know what you want to be or achieve or do when you get out of university, uh, even down to what kind of areas other than the dentists. Um, and... And as you get, and you don't know very much at all about the state of these professions today. It's like with Dentons, Dentons have automated their entire paralegal layer using artificial intelligence. Um, mm. You know, so from a from a career day perspective, these kids had never, no one had ever sat down with these kids and said, okay, if you're interested in dentistry. That's great. That's fine. That's your North Star. But these are some of the innovations and breakthroughs and trajectories and new jobs that we're seeing in dentistry. Have you thought about these? You know, so on the one hand, education, I think, has the hardest job because it's trying to prepare children for lifelong earning, you know, a wage. Um, mm. And this is where we sort of bring in, might as well bring in the topic of lifelong learning, because with organizations like, like, like myself, when we're having a look at how we reinvent universities and the purpose of universities, the fact of the matter is that everyone who's listening to this that has a job for a company, that company is putting you through training. So that's great. But the training that you are going through is generally to benefit the company you know so the company says you know we have a skills gap here so we're going to give you a set of training so that you can do this um that's the benefit of the company now one of the conversations i had with the lasalle group down in barcelona was from a university perspective universities which are struggling for funding and all sorts of different things we're seeing attendances drop etc cetera, etc cetera. um universities mm. are in a prime position where they have relationships with big business companies and employers they have a huge amount of experts within the university who have deep domain knowledge of particular things but unlike the companies that we used to work for and others still work for universities are in an ideal position where they can say as an individual what do, would you like to do what kind of job would you like what's your purpose what's your north star and then they can build a learning curriculum and an apprenticeship um, program around the individual that is specifically for the individual, whereas companies will say, this is what we need you to do. So we will train you to do this. Yes. Um, and then, I mean, it probably again, be a little bit remiss of me basically just to mention Accenture. Because mm. as we start seeing the pace of automation in both blue collar work and white collar work picking up, so cognitive work, Accenture about four years ago now looked at the future of jobs and they looked at their own employees and they went to 17,000 people and said in the next few years we're going to automate your job however we think that 
these are the jobs of the future. And it was things like software development, um, immersive world building, change management, project management, you know, all that sort of stuff. And they then put training programs in place. So years later, when they went to these 17,000 employees and said, we've automated your job, you know, you are now officially redundant. At exactly the same time, they gave all these employees a handshake and said, but you're not leaving the company. You're now going into your new job in your new role. So when, which sort of brings me back to what I said earlier about as individuals, we have to be able to adapt and learn at speed because as automation and technologies of different colors have different impacts on the future of work and the workforce and the workplace, mm -hmm. increasingly we need the inherent skills within us to be able to move from this job to this job. But we can't do that in three years. Sometimes you might need to do it at speed, which is where very early on in our conversation, I was talking about, it's not in my mind, not just about the future of education. It's about the future of learning. So how, we learn, how quickly we learn, what we learn, the tools that we use to learn. So Peter Diamandis, uh, who's a, a relatively famous global futurist um, for many decades has said, Technology is developing at an exponential rate, along with Ray Kurzweil, who says that as well. But he then says this, he says, however, our brains have not had a software update for 200,000 years. And I, I kind of say, isn't education our software update? Um, and unless just as a completely weird random stat um i came across this about six months ago um while technology is developing at an absolutely furious and exponential pace it's estimated that for our brains to actually catch up with the changes that have taken place over the past hundred years it will take at least 20,000 years for our brains to evolve to be able to manage the status quo that we have today. Which, I mean, that's, that's from a neuroscientist as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, of course, like, like it, any information, any piece of research is questionable. It's uh, as there is no <laughs> yeah, no. It's, it's one of those it's interesting little you know, that I pick like, up. But you should go. Really? You know, I I want like man, twenty thousand years. Like yeah. I hope it's twenty thousand, yeah, twenty thousand well, years better. <laughs> well, this is it. It's. So in that particular piece of research, they were kind of looking at things like information overload. So they said in order for our brains to really become at one with information overload, yeah, it's going to take our brains 20,000 years to kind of get to the point where we aren't overloaded with information. Even though we have yeah. huge amounts of information coming at us, we go, oh, that's fine. I've uh, seen it, understood it, processed it, stored it. Um, but, you know, this is sort of why I think education is so absolutely fundamental, because as the world around us changes in so many different ways, whether it's politically, technologically, environmentally, you know, et cetera, societally, um, we can actually adapt. And over the past hundred years, we've actually got better at managing complexity as humans, according to some of the latest, the latest psychology research, which you might like. Um, but it's not that we can't adapt to what's here or what's coming. It's that we need the right environment, the right communities, right. access to the tools and the resources to do it. Because that, we're always uh, told that as humans, we are the most complex beings in the known universe. That's it. So if the world is, is changing around us so fast, if we are the universe's most complex beings, why are we stuck with an education system that was created in the 1800s? Yeah. 
because it relies a lot on the external environment as well. And I think here you pointed out a very important element and it links also to the cultural aspect that the environment and as I was mentioning, you know, I came back to Romania from the UK and the environment definitely was different. So I was yeah. talking with this guy in the law firm and the environment is uh, absorbing us because, you know, like, let's say um, it's one year, two years, five years, 10 years when that we live in a city, a community, a country, yeah. And that environment from with all the uh, inputs that it has and outputs that it has will absorb us. I mean, definitely it's impossible that we are shifting the local community and the environment a lot. It's just, yeah, we can make some, we, we bring our um, presence with our know-how, with our um capabilities with the things that we can do is just that um, the values the principles that the community has will be um, absorbed by us so yeah. we will need to live with them i mean if we want to be in that community then we okay we can say okay moving to another country and that is a, a shift yeah it changes because it has different values different language different yeah. so the environment is completely different maybe it's tropical so That'd you know nice. you have you have to wear something else you have yeah so it it is shaping us a lot and i think it's um, an important aspect to take into account by the um, um, all the system not only the educational system because um it it shifts the awareness like okay what is happening around us and how does it impact us and how do we impact because this is also the um the trigger for making changes right like yeah. there's something that we want to change outside then there's a need okay so we start to act on on it and on on them and to start like ah oh, come on guys we have to change this we have to change this and slowly slowly the environment is changing and evolving though yeah it's very systemic uh, work and multi-layered and uh, complex and very beautiful right it's uh well it's, it's, it's a wonder to, it is a wonder to see basically when all this i mean you're right you know it's there, there is so much complexity and there are so many different layers to be should we say addressed when we're thinking about not just the future or the future of education but everything that you know when it kind of all comes together you know it's like a symphony it sounds beautiful it looks beautiful and that's the moment basically you kind of have that eureka sort of uh reaction where you just go that works but then certainly when i've kind of experienced those moments for myself not only have i sort of gone blimey it worked i'm gone i'm amazed it worked it's like wow didn't think that was going to happen you know so that's that sort of art of surprise and um i mean it's like you know with the with these lessons that we did with um the year 10s um we didn't really know what we were going to see you know we didn't really know what to expect um but just to see them sort of come together be so inquisitive so curious so engaged um was just on the one hand amazing to see the output was even more amazing um but then i suppose what was a little bit sad was at the end of that we called it the 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 exponential futures curriculum the efc mm -hmm. again that's kind of online and in the books that people can sort of have a look at um the shame of it was when it was actually ended all the children were so i just go back to regular school now i mean we did it in school but you know they said well so i've just got to go back basically to uh you know regular classes and everything else and even even the teachers because we actually or i did it basically with the teachers and the headmasters and the headmaster and everything else um even they were you know this needs to be continued and you know just through time pressures and everything else it, you know i've i've not sort of been able to keep it up per se because yeah i'm bouncing all over the world on a far too regular basis um but you know when we're having a look out out in the wider world 
I think the vast majority of people seem to think that the future is something that is done to them from an environment perspective. You know, 65% of adults are worried about the future. 75% of children are worried about the future. Um, mm. And so by not having an education system which helps head on or tackles some of these issues head on, I think on the one hand, basically we're do doing ourselves a giant disservice. But on the other hand, there is the the significant danger that today's education system and systems are producing children that when they go into the workforce in 2030, 2035, 2040, those, those future of work uh, experiences that the children will actually have will be absolutely unlike anything that they have been prepared for because we are preparing them in using industrial age education curricula generally you know i mean there obviously have been some modifications but generally it's an industrial age curriculum we're still teaching them in much the same way that we taught them 100 years ago in the same environments same in quite often quite a lot of similar siloed thinking you know we teach this class and this yeah. lesson and we don't do that cross-domain thematic learning or the experiential learning or we don't put them out into the real world or provide them with too many apprenticeships which is obviously another good way basically to sort of bridge the gap between school and the real and the real workforce um and i do you know, i do feel basically that without proper reform we are at high risk of seeing an entire generation or generations worth of students being fundally, fundamentally underprepared for what is increasingly a science fiction future. You know, AIs basically that are have better levels of intelligence than humans, um, better abilities, better skill sets, uh, let alone, you know, immersive worlds basically which themselves are science fiction like or robots that design themselves or i mean no, there yeah. are so many sci-fi examples i have i'm not even going to start that but i've got some videos on site on how science fiction is already science fact <laughs> and you know synthetic biology is another one you know web3 and blockchain um or others you know the ability basically to get AI to build a $250 million company like we saw with the main coin crypto to uh, turbo toad in America a little while ago. Um, the rise of fully autonomous companies, which we're already seeing and which Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI basically has been recently talking about as well, um, where AI mil builds multi-billion dollar companies that have one person. Uh, you know, when we have a look at the future that we are already seeing and experiencing let alone the near medium and long-term future mm. things are changing beyond all recognition in many ways and at many levels of society even down to things like child protection you know most child protection systems don't talk about deep fakes or how to oh, interact yeah. with a digital human that's got a neural network brain that's talking to you like a real human, but who's actually trying to get you to trust it so it can scam you or radicalize you. You know, yeah. we are so yeah. far off base. This is, I think, this is so why I, these academic things. I, crazy. I, yeah. I moved to the next door office because I have this uh, painting uh, behind yeah. me with the, with the hand and the strings and, uh, you know, I, I realize that, you know, we, we are talking about how much we are shaped by different uh, actors, yeah. so starting from the environment to the role models and uh, the things that are happening around us. So, yeah. Um, yeah. and it's also about us trusting that, um, you know, we are also shaped and um, shown uh, different ways, different paths, different options that yeah, we have the 
possibility and we have the freedom to choose and to decide which uh, which way we are going though to get to that freedom of uh, choice and decision making um, we have all those skills that you were mentioning so that we are getting into all these ais and um, uh, knowing how to use them and get the most out of them yeah. it's super important that we are uh, trained uh, and go in practice and do do the actual uh, work that uh, is training our abilities so that we can uh, interact with the AIs in the most successful way absolutely and it's yeah and it's that it's the oh, fundamentally I think you know when we look at education my belief is that education is trying to fundamentally prepare you to be an independent adult for example who can stand on his or her own two feet, but who actually has a good level of control over their own future. Yeah, And there are far too many things in society basically that try to control us and hold us down. Um, there are too many things that hold us back when they needn't actually hold us back. And yeah, when we have a look at the future being done to us, you know, we kind of hop back to those three questions. What would you do as an individual if everything that you could imagine in your, in your head could be brought to life and then thrust onto the global stage at a speed that was unfathomable 20 years ago? Yeah, you know, it's when we talk about education, education's role, I think, is to fundamentally do the best job that it can at helping individuals unlock their own kind of what I call unlimited potential, especially in today's world. Yeah. And there is the opportunity for us to change the education system. There is the need for us to change the education system, what is taught, how it's taught, et cetera, et cetera, and why it's taught. That's it. But again, sort of bringing it back to your point, yeah, talk, as we kind of have here, that's one thing. That's good in many respects. It's a very good step. Action, it's just talk. Yeah, yeah. And we are all still yes, puppets so, on the string. So now that we're getting closer to action, um, hmm. I think it's a uh, bit relevant also to mention that um um and also how we got to to this uh, dialogue that we're having today is through the fact that we want to and we are organizing this uh, summit in brashov which yeah. is focused on um, leadership in education and being uh, being the change so um, that's what we want to do that uh, we are identifying the best ways forward so that we contribute to um, transforming changing however you want to to put it out but to improve the educational system and uh, the people who are part of um, uh, an educational system either that uh, it's something new that starts but to put together the best ideas the best ways and to move forward uh, in a think tank so that uh, we bring uh, the best that we can to our uh, children to our peers to the parents so we can uh, we can be part of a world that we all want to live in you know yeah. so and participate in and participate in yes improve or whatever term yeah. we'd like to use there but that's it so on that note so how do people get hold of you have you got any resources that you'd actually like to share etc etc uh yeah i'm very happy to share um, uh, links and uh, information in the in the description of uh, the the video and uh, yes we can be found at elnn.eu so it's the european lead by nature that uh, we initiated a few years ago so together with our partners who are working in 
uh, youth NGOs, in uh, universities, in research institutes, and um, forward thinking um, and disruptors, let's say, disruptors. We like disruptors. Uh, disruptors, yes. Yeah. Uh, disruptors who don't take no so, for an answer. Oh, yeah, exactly. So yeah. it's always uh, someone that is curious and uh, looking to... Uh, to improve something that uh, hurts around. So yeah, we all gather in Brasov uh, from the 15th to the 17th of November, and we are happy that you are joining us and we will have uh, various workshops, hands-on workshops, so we'll not be having yeah. talks. We are uh, limited to around 100 uh, people in the whole activity so that we can make the most of it. and. To move, um, to move ideas around us and identify the best uh, ways uh, forward. So what uh, nice thing that we will be doing, um, it will be the design thinking, uh, on, the ongoing design thinking workshop that is facilitated by uh, an expert in the topic uh, and in the method. Uh, so basically, uh, all the data and the outcomes of each workshop will be dragged into this design thinking that will be processing throughout the days uh, of the summit mm -hmm. so that we will have uh, a mapping of the most valuable ideas, of the pain points, of the stakeholders and actors that uh, we should involve so um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to to see that uh, mapping at the end. Though, oh, yeah, also enjoying the journey. Yeah, absolutely, you got to enjoy the journey. Although saying that, as an entrepreneur, basically there are es there are aspects basically of the journey that I would like to just steamroll. <laughs> it's like that, like that cut. Yeah, in the like the cut command basically in a word document, you just go. I've learned a lot by going through all that pain and everything else. You know, it's made it made me who I am today. Chop. Don't want to do that again. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's uh, disruption isn't easy. Change isn't easy. That's it. Damn hard. However, if you actually get it right, and actually, even if you just move the dial, some of the yeah, some of the results basically can be absolutely phenomenal. So I'm looking forward to joining you all in Brasol. That's it. We will probably share maybe some of that mapping as well with the community. And oh, uh, yeah. in the meantime, yeah. that's it. It's been great talking to you. Same, same, <laughs> same. Likewise, it's been a pleasure, Matthew. Yeah. Well, as always, and I will catch you in Brasol. Thank you, Vlad. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Have a great day. Ta-da.